question. You see, you cannot divorce yourself from your patients in terms of, of the emotions that are there, and yet you cannot be effective if you are overcome by every patient and every emotional experience that you have. So there, that means you then have to seek a balance in your life with how you deal with that. So the way you deal with that, forgive me because I think this is very important to what I was thinking. For those of you who heard that and thought that was the sort of slogan, let me tell you how it, what it means. The first thing you, it means is this. When I was a resident in surgery at National Naval Medical Center, my instructors really beat me up badly for five years. And I used to ask them, why, do you, why are you so mean? And they, and, and they finally said, because when you leave us, you won't be able to talk to us anymore. We want to make sure you're ready to do what you need to do because you don't even have a clue as to what you're going to do. So that means you have to be professionally ready to do it. In other words, you have to be secure that you can get that care. The personal part is very important because the personal part goes to, is your family life okay? How are you getting along? You know, because a lot of the things that we do bleed over into the work that we give or the experiences that we have. Because when things are out of balance on one side, you try to put them into balance on this side. And often what happens is you don't do anything but weave a tangled web of knots, which it takes years and years and years for somebody, a lot of money for somebody to sit down and help you untangle. And the third thing is, it ain't about you. And it's not about the person. Here's, a, here's an example of what I mean it's not about you. So you come out of the operating room and your patient uh, has had a bad event or has even died. So it's your fault. Well, maybe it is your fault. Probably it isn't your fault. Or here's even a better example. So you operated on a patient, they had cancer, they had a recurrence, and they died. So why are you beating yourself? You, you didn't cause the cancer, you didn't cause the recurrence, and you did a good operation. So why are you taking this on so much? Well, the key here is sometimes we forget that we are not the number one person. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? We often forget that it ain't really about me. There's a family out there. There's another person out there. And there's even a God out there that's not about me. So when we don't do those things and keep them in balance, uh, we, we become less and less effective in terms of what we're trying to get done. So, so that's what I meant by that. That's the answer. Yes, sir. And then I'll come over here. Uh, the emphasis on research in military medicine. It, it's a great emphasis on research. Uh, military medicine has probably about uh, $800, uh, $800 million budget, between five and $800 million a year. Uh, and there's a great deal of, of basic research, and then there's a basic there's a great deal of translational research that's going on particularly at Navy Medical Research Command and the Walter Reed Institute of Research. Uh, one example of that is that is uh, the malaria vaccines that are now being tested uh, coming out of the, uh, the Naval uh, Medical Center, the, um, not National Naval Medical Center, but the Navy Research um, Naval. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the, I want to say NAMRI actually, Research Institute. It used to be an institute when I was when I worked there, but it is not any longer. It's Navy Medical Research Command. But the key is that we we uh, it's an integral part of what we do from a military medicine point of view. It's also an integral part of what we do from a medical education point of view. So we have a great deal of clinical research going on in, in our medical centers and throughout Navy medicine. It, it's uh, something that we uh, we value quite highly. question is, how does residency work in the military if you want to have your own private practice? When you finish your residency, you have to give back time to the military. And then at the end of your time, you know, the, I've been in 30 years, but I could have gotten out at like 12 years, 12, 13 years. So at the at 12th year, which would have been 1986 for me, which would have been, I'm sorry, 1987 for me, which was after I finished my call in the rectal, uh, I actually interviewed for different jobs as, as a professor at different universities uh, and decided to stay in the military. The, the point is that at some point, if you want to get out, you get out and you go do private practice or go do something else. And most of us, we, we have a great many people to get out every year, so most of us don't stay. Oh, no, residency. We have residents in the military. 
we have a full spectrum of residencies. You name a residency, we have it within the military. And, and we have it at different institutions. Yes. So you do your residency with us. You can also do your residency outside and come into the military. Most of we're, we're gearing now to having you do your residency with us and then and then moving as opposed to doing it outside. But we do both. Yes, ma'am. The statistics of women in military medicine. Um, the, the diversity in, in, in military medicine is the highest in the military, and that's actually because of women, because of the Navy Nurse Corps. Uh, the number of women that we have totally in the military medical department is probably 25 or 30 percent of the total department. Uh, and I'm talking, I'm talking dentists, foremen, the whole thing. Uh, but we have uh, the women in medicine and women in the Nurse Corps and women in Allied Sciences, uh, we have a, a tremendous number. I mean, we, we have to be probably um, among the best in the United States. And, and I will tell you, that the reason for that is because the Navy Nurse Corps. Because the Navy Nurse Corps is almost, uh, the Navy Nurse Corps, I think, is 100 years old, but the, it's 108 years old. But the key is the Navy Nurse Corps, uh, there have been Navy nurses that have been with us forever. And so women in medicine, okay, I'm not speaking of physicians, women in medicine, that has been there, and then women in medicine physicians have been there since uh, probably, particularly the 1970s, uh, has really come on strong. So we have uh, a number of women who are commanding officers of hospitals, who are department heads, and who are, who are throughout Navy medicine. Yes, sir. The question is the, and if I don't get it right, correct me. The question is, what's the difference between military and private sector uh, medical uh, uh, physicians? In other words, how are they treated? What what sort of life do they have, and and how do they have? I think the biggest difference between private sector and military in terms of physicians. And remember, you're talking to someone who has never been on the private sector as a physician. I've only been in the military. But when I talk to my colleagues on the on the private side, I think that two major things I want to tell you. You're going to make more money in private practice than you will in the military. Military is comparable, but you're going to make more money generally in, in private practice. And you need to look at the specialty, because many of my colleagues will tell you that's not necessarily true. But here's the thing that you can't beat, from my point of view, and that is the, the uh, what I call the discretionary time that you have in the military is much greater than private practice. Military is a huge practice, no matter how you want to cut it. It's not that you don't have responsibility for your patients and you take them. You do. But it's still a group practice. It depends on what sort of practice you're in and outside as to how you how you can live. And the discretionary time that my military physicians have is much greater than you'll have as a private physician. That means time with your family and doing other things. I think those are the two biggest things. In terms of practice and how you take care of patients, there's no difference. I mean, the, 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 the technology and the, and the things that You'll come from whatever civilian institutions you come to our institutions, you'll find the same things. And you'll go from our institutions to civilian. You, 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 it's completely translation, I mean, uh, uh, transfer. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. The question is, everyone in the military is given free pr prescriptions. What's the cost of that, and will that change? And the answer is, that is, it, essentially, that is correct. Uh, and, you know, I'll then have to dive down and say, well, what do you mean by everyone in the military? But, yes, active duty and family members, uh, the, the cost of their medicine is part of the benefit that they receive from the cost of that is, I, I, I can get back to you. Actually, I know some numbers, but I'd rather just not say them here because they're not going to be the right ones. Because I'm going to talk about numbers on the retired population, and I don't know what the active duty population is. But it's obviously uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars, millions of dollars that we use, but that's part of the benefit that we have. Um, how will that change in the next administration? That won't change in 